This episode, I'm joined by Edward Bering, who is an intellectual historian specialising in 20th century Europe. He is an associate professor of history and human values at Princeton University. In this episode, we discuss his book, Converts to the Real, Catholicism and the Making of Continental Philosophy, alongside discussions on Heidegger, Jacques Maritain, Edith Stein, Edmund Husserl, Phenomenology, and more. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible, and if you would like to support Hermetics and gain access to some exclusive content, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. Uh, Edward Baring, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Great to be here. We are going to be discussing your book, Converts to the Real, Catholicism and the Making of Continental Philosophy, which was published 2019 by Harvard University Press, so a relatively recent book. Um, an extremely encyclopedic intellectual history of the beginnings of continental philosophy, predominantly looking at the history the history or the religious history in a certain way of the of phenomenology primarily taking its trajectory from Husserl which is really where phenomenology starts especially for uh, our understanding of what uh, continental philosophy is today um, and then spiraling off into thinkers such as Heidegger etc and seeing where uh, you know this sort of underlying Catholicism which was there within many many of these thinkers uh, perhaps as you say as we were just saying hasn't been sort of avoided but has been neglected uh, in the intellectual history of uh, of continental philosophy. But before we get into your book, um, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what it is you do, and, you know, how this book came about, because I think it's quite a quite a rare book, really. Thank you very much. Um, well, so I'm an intellectual historian, um, and um, I guess the path this book started with my first book, which is uh, An Intellectual History of Jacques Derrida. And I was, you know, a graduate student, I was trying to find a project and um, for various reasons, nobody had really been to the Derrida archives in, um, in California and Normandy. And so I thought, you know, this seems a, a good project. And um, one of the, the main uh, theses or, or, or most, perhaps most controversial argument about the book is that Derrida's ideas are shaped in a context um, where religious thought is enormously important. So he draws on Catholic thinkers who shape his understanding of what would become deconstruction. And this is not something that I was looking for. In fact, when I first went to the uh, um, Derrida archives, I looked at various other things. Um, I looked for his reading of Sartre. I was interested in that. Um, and it was only as I tried to contextualize how he was reading Sartre that I kept stumbling across all these Catholics. And then when I went back to the archives a year later, I realized that everywhere I'd stopped in the archives, stopped transcribing notes, I'd left out essays on God, on theology or on atheism. Um, and so it became clear to me that um, he was at least deeply interested in religious topics as a young man. And that part of the argument is that this shapes not without necessarily making his thought religious or Catholic. In fact, he famously said that he rightly passes as an atheist, but it was nourished by um, uh, Christian thought. And then as I said, my second project which is, um, was an attempt to try and understand this strange thing called continental philosophy. Hmm. Um, why is it that there is at least some commonality between philosophical ideas in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Poland, and elsewhere? Um, Catholicism seemed a good lead because I needed an explanation that was large enough to, to explain the problem that needs to be sort of continent wide or indeed global. Um, and Catholics were um, served that purpose. And the more I looked in, the more sort of Catholics seemed to appear early on, translating books, writing first essays, um, uh, especially of, as you said, the work of Edmund Husserl and his phenomenology. Um, it's this, this, this strange philosophical subfield, let's say in the book, that can boast two saints, both Kawa Tiwa, future John Paul II, and Edith Stein, um, who was Husserl's uh, assistant before she was murdered at Auschwitz. Um, and so it, it seemed that um, it was an explanation that could be, have real power in explaining this quite strange historical um, phenomenon, which is this continent-wide philosophy. And finally, just the example that I really like um, is of the Husserl archives, which are now in the Catholic University of uh, Louvain, and they were saved by a uh, young Franciscan priest, Leo Hermann van Breda, 
Um, and the first attempt to try and, it's 1938, we're in Germany, Husserl um, was a, a free Christian, as he called himself, but was born to a Jewish family. Um, and so there was worry about his, he'd been um, unable to use the library at Freiburg University after he was declared emeritus. And there was worries that his papers would be lost in um, Nazi Germany. And so they needed to get out. And the first attempt was a Benedictine nun called Adel Gundes Jägerschmidt, who took them down these 40,000 pages of notes to the um, uh, Swiss border. And they were going to sort of tie them under the habits of the nuns. They were going to march them over the hills into Switzerland. And uh, um, which I love. It's sort of like it's a philosophical version of the sound of music, nuns, Nazis, and hiking. Um, <laughs> in, in the end, this was far too dangerous. But I think it does kind of just show how, in kind of this very, very concrete sense, the Catholic Church and Catholics were really quite central in globalizing, internationalizing phenomenology and helping produce this thing called continental philosophy. Yeah. Okay. Um, one question just before I do ask the hermetics question, because my master's was specifically in continental philosophy. So I'm always intrigued as to how people see it. How do you feel about that divide generally, the, the, the continental analytic? So, I mean, I think that it is a divide in people's heads more than anything else. I think that it's a divide in people's heads which has shaped institutions. For me, I didn't latch onto the term continental philosophy because I think there is, uh, um, because I think it has a unity that is distinct from analytical philosophy. It's more that it drew attention to this international nature of continental philosophy, of phenomenology especially, which is, I think, truly astounding. You know, anyone who's tried to pick up Heidegger in German knows that reading philosophical texts in another language is pretty hard. And so what is it that made you know, a dense German philosophy, which was in some ways quite provincial in the early part of the 20th century, into something that was being read all over the world. Um, and so the, it's more, I'm suspicious of the term continental philosophy, but I like the way that it pays attention to this, this strangeness. As I say, it's, it's, it's a historical enigma uh, standing in plain sight. Okay, that's an interesting way of looking at it, though, which I think was, I'd probably be more agreeable that it, continental philosophy as a term isn't actually anything to do with philosophy, but to do with this historical yeah. sort of historical lineage. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, but as I say, before we, we jump in with the with the book and the, the the questions of this history, I do have to ask you the hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room, and. Uh, listen in on the conversation who do you pick and they all miraculously speak english or the same language <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so I, I suppose i took this question for the book and at the very end of my of the book i in some ways i stage a conversation between jacques maritain the um french thomist philosopher from the mid-century um who was very important in you know thinking about um you know personalist turn in, in catholic philosophy and also development of human rights um and Quentin Meassou, who is this relatively young French uh, uh, speculative realist um, who wears kind of his atheism on his sort of sleeve. And um, what I was interesting about them is that they, despite their seeming differences, um, they both want to, they're both arguing against the same group of thinkers. Um, so I would perhaps also add in a, a second Catholic philosopher, Gabriel Marcel, one of the first Christian Catholic existentialists. And they both argue against it in a way that um, leads them to very similar positions. They both want to find a way out of what they see as the subjectivism of modern philosophy to get to the mind independent real. They both, both look for uh, kind of an intellectual intuition that allows us to escape from the human subject. And they both do that in order to make space for the natural sciences, which they think have been neglected by our modern philosophy. Um, and so I'd like to see what they would say to each other, how, whether they would see these commonalities, whether they would think about their, how they would think about their common reaction against Marcel. And, um, and I would find this interesting because one of the major points in my book is I'd like, I, I'd like to uh, push back against the kind of 
the way in which some of these divisions between Christian and non-Christian, religious and secular, um, have been absolutized. And sometimes I think the um, divisions within the Catholic Church are often larger than the divisions between Catholics and non-Catholics, even and on some philosophical questions are more greater than between Catholics and atheists. And it's pointing out those strange commonalities um, is, I, you know, that's what I try to do in the book. Um, mm. Is it, So this conversation would be a clear example of that where someone who's secular and, and a Catholic are more aligned philosophically against uh, yeah. this uh, the, an interdivision. Yeah. And so, so, so there's a, you know, uh, I mean, in some ways, so Gabriel Marcel and Jacques Maritain were both alive at the same time. They were friends. They, you know, so they met each other at each other's home. They had these long, in-depth conversations. But on a philosophical level, they thought that they were both not just misguided, but dangerously misguided. Um, that uh, one, at one moment, um, uh, the, the principle which Maritain uses in order to be able to open access to the, the uh, extra mental world is the principle of identity. And um, Gabriel Marcel attacks this principle, thinks that it is, uh, um, fails to understand the complex richness of our experience um, and denies it. And when he did that, Maritain declared that this was like Peter disavowing Christ. So for both being both Catholics, both, um, but diverging in profound ways on how they understand the philosophical underpinnings of that Catholicism. And in some ways, the, uh, um, you know, may I assume in an attempt to try and seek um, space for the natural sciences within modern philosophy, which um, opens up the type of path, uh, kind of open up this, the propodeutics of faith that, uh, um, that Maritain was interested in. Okay. Okay. So that room would be a purely practical room for you, just to to answer some sort of ongoing disputes of what's happening in this te in this text. Yeah, it, 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 an experiment. Okay. How, how do you, do you, do you think there would be any any anyone there would give give way, or do you just think it would be quite a raucous room? I, I think probably I think it would be quite a raucous room. Um, I, I mean, I, it, what would be interesting is to think how. They articulate their differences and how, what they would focus on. So there are some important differences that one can recognise between Mersu and Marcel. I, you know, uh, um, for Mersu pushes on what he calls the, the principle of insufficient reason. That there's always the possibility that something could be otherwise, um, and that allows him to um, argue for a radical contingency, um, which I think Maritain would reject. Um, but I would be interested to see how they would how they would articulate their differences and what they would see as ultimately um, separating them. Okay. Okay. Well, these these thinkers will definitely come back in because they're they're you know they're sort of throughout the text, um, especially this the the in depth discussions that you've already mentioned. I mean, that's a fantastic section of the book when you're talking about this this. I think I think I'm right in thinking that this is the reading group where they they meet up and it's people from all walks of life are meeting a real sort of it seems very strange that 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 would that would even happen but it was a brilliant little section in the book um which we may get to but um throughout the text there is something which you refer to as the progressive project which seems to be sort of a cornerstone for this history almost an anchor which everything is um orbiting around in its own way and understanding it in its own way, which transforms people's understanding. So, what do you? Yeah, what 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 can we understand by this this progressive project? Right. So, I mean, I suppose this speaks to what I I said before. I'm interested in the ways in which conversations uh, exist across seemingly sharp intellectual divides: Catholic, you know, non-Catholic, um, secular, um, and so on. And one way in which that's happening is this um, is kind of this what's called progressive neoscholasticism. People have different names. It's, it's all over the Europe, but the the main idea is is that one way in which Catholics are looking to have discussions and engage with non-Catholics is in a broader attempt to sort of, in some ways, to convert modernity. A sense that modernity has taken a wrong path, um, and that it is necessary to engage with um, modern thinkers. Um, and to encourage them to rethink their relationship to Catholicism, to convert them, essentially. 
And um, what for the progressives, so in the Catholic Church after um, the sort of establishment of Thomism as a quasi orthodoxy, you know, never mm-hmm. a full orthodoxy, but quasi orthodoxy at the end of the 19th century, there were kind of two paths. One is to say, well, modernity has, is, has taken a wrong path. And so therefore we need to protect Thomism in its purity. Um, we need to be, we need to be strict Thomists we as carefully as possible. And we don't want to uh, um, make concessions to modernity in order to try and you know, entice some unbelievers to the faith. What we need is we need to demonstrate kind of a pure and rigorous Thomism that in itself will you know, be attractive. But the progressives say, no, 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 well, um, Aquinas himself was updating Aristotelian thought. Um, he himself was engaging with the people around him. And as one of the key figures in my work, Cardinal Desiré Mercier in Belgium, who was the leader of this progressive group um, at the Catholic University of Louvain, he said, you know, if uh, um, Aquinas was here today, he would be using the test tube and microscope. He would be in the laboratory and he would be engaging with modern science. He would be showing... Um, using all the most modern techniques in order to, to develop his broader project. And this is what Thomism should be doing today. Um, and this was, and they said, well, Thomism is it's, it's a rational philosophy, places a huge amount of emphasis on unaided human reason. Um, it's also um, a realist philosophy. So it actually works very well with science. And so if you look in Thomist institutes around Europe, you know, they have laboratories connected to them and they are doing, this is where um, figures are forms of uh, experimental psychology, cosmology are all being, um, and engaging very much with uh, mainstream work on those topics. Um, it becomes a little bit more difficult when it comes with philosophy because there, whereas modern science seems to them to be consonant in some way with Thomism, modern science, modern philosophy had, has by most accounts had taken a wrong direction, had become too, em- placed too much emphasis on the knowing subject, um, too little emphasis on the rational order of the world. Um, and so there was a big effort to try and work out how to rethink Thomism that would be open to and legible to modern philosophers in order to usher them towards the truth of Thomist truths. Um, and that's why these progressive Thomists who are desperately looking for points of connection in sort of mainstream, um, mostly secular philosophy were so attracted by Husserl because Husserl in his 1900, 1901 logical investigations seemed to be moving beyond the constitutive subject to describe um, the order of the world, to, to, to bring out essential structures of um, the world that according to the Thomist would ultimately lead um, their readers to recognize a existent order and therefore a creator and therefore God. Um, so Husserl was this convert, a modern convert who seemed to be recognizing the truths of Catholicism. And that's why they latched onto his thought. And that's why they started to translate his work and discuss him in, across Europe um, with great excitement. Mm-hmm. And this, this, Catholic, this underlying Catholicism at the beginning of uh, you know, at the beginning of phenomenology, really, of the beginning of Husserlian scholarship, is this overlooked immediately? Because the the funny, the strange thing about Husserl and phenomenology, which you point out, is that it almost immediately splits in two directions, basically at once. You know, it goes in the the Catholic direction, well, the predominantly Catholic direction of saying, look, this bolsters yeah. our claims. Uh, this is in line with Thomism, as you said. But then it, it immediately also goes in the other direction of saying. This opens up basically a, a, a secularism, you know, a philosophy of, of, of and then an atheistic current which puts the, the human almost in the centre. And these things yeah. almost happen concurrently. And my question really is, even though the, the Catholics, you know, save Husserl, as you sort of say, and save all his writing and translate him, is their, their uh, relationship with Husserl overlooked almost immediately? Yeah. So, great. I mean, I think it, it is. I mean, it... As you say, that how quickly it happens is, is kind of remarkable. There's a wonderful moment where 
So what you're talking about, this, this development in Husserl's thought as when he published his, his ideas for a pure phenomenology in 1913, um, which seems to go in a direction, which we can talk about later why it goes in a slightly different direction. Um, but the Catholics are super excited about this. They've, they've just grabbed hold of him. It's only about three or, in the last two or three years. Um, in one, in the Revista of Philosophia Neoscholastica based in Milan, they say that there's this new book coming. We're super <laughs> excited. <laughs> and they say, we'll have a long review when we, when we get it. And then, of course, the book comes and there's no review because it's um, a profound disappointment. I would say that even before then, I think there's, I mean, there is, um, these ideas are, they are still relatively marginal. They're marginal in, in, in one sense because Husserl himself is not really paying a huge amount of attention to them. Husserl is, doesn't believe that his, you know, his thought is a path to the Catholic faith. He himself is, um, you know, as I say, a free Christian, which is the free is often free from Catholicism, <laughs> as it's understood um, uh, in Central Europe at the time. Um, and so he tended to be relatively dismissive of these Catholic readers. Um, there are you know, a fair number of them around him that he uh, knows. And I think the second reason why it's also relatively marginal from the beginning is that the whole point is that these are Catholic thinkers who are, have in some ways huge networks that cover uh, Europe and the globe, um, are, but they often feel very marginalized to mainstream philosophy. That's why they're so interested in any kind of uh, um, any kind of traction in mainstream philosophy. When, when Husserl seems to say something that's uh, parallel to what they're saying, they get very excited. Um, so that they are, you know, they are often in institutions which are outside. So in Paris, you have the Institut Catholique, but it's not part of the Sorbonne. It's not part of the uh, mainstream university system, which, which excludes um, religious theological thinking um, after the lay city laws. It's in places like Poland, but it's very marginal. In, in Germany, there are these you know, seats for Catholic philosophers in mainstream universities, um, but they're often treated with a little bit of disdain by their colleagues. So I think that, you know, the um, they are sort of overlooked at the time because they are in an institutionally much weaker position. But ironically, it's because they're in an institutionally much weaker position within each individual national context that, the, that they're so much more better linked across these national contexts than, that they become this web that allows these ideas to travel. So whereas, you know, uh, um, Josef Geiser, who is Husserl, is, a, is a, a Catholic philosopher in Freiburg alongside Husserl, is not being read. I mean, Husserl reads him and sort of look, coughs rather embarrassedly and doesn't pay much attention. Um, but Geyser is being read all over Europe in a way that at the beginning Husserl isn't because Geyser has tapped into these Catholic networks. He's read by seemingly marginalized people all over the continent. Um, and so, so it's, it's an interesting marginality, a marginality that actually in some ways makes them quite powerful and influential, but marginal nonetheless. Okay. So not to be not to be sort of too cliche, but who who sells, um, you know his the the rise of his philosophy then is really not to do with any sort of networking effect, but to do with the you know the the power of his philosophy itself, the originality of it. So I mean, it's his he gets support in Germany from a range of different thinkers, some of whom are, are connected to Catholics, especially in, in the University of Munich. Um, so there's a big phenomenological school that builds there. Um, his, the interest of his work, um, I think the reason I would suggest that Husserl has become so important is because he was able to, his work was able to interest people like Josef Geiser, people like August Messer, you know, Leon Noel, these Catholics who did not themselves feel particularly central or important, but who were part of this network which allowed them once they latched onto Husserl's ideas it allowed the, those ideas to travel very very quickly mm -hmm. okay okay and now yeah so this this question that I brought up and I mean this is one of the most almost um and I don't mean to sort of cheapen it but almost funny things about the book as I was reading through it is the is the the, the divide which we which you know I, I mentioned you mentioned a little bit there which phenomenon phenomenology from Husserl quite literally converts some people to Catholicism 
and quite literally draws some That's people on. completely away from God. And I think actually takes some Catholics away from God. Yeah. Um, so this exact yeah. same writing quite literally yeah. causes a divide. And and yeah, so is perhaps I'd ask as a, the intellectual historian question first, is there a historical reason for this in terms of who sells philosophy or do you think it's predominantly a philosophical question? I mean, I think it is a kind of, uh, it's it's a philosophical question which is connected to kind of historical reasons. And I think partly it's to do with this uh, um, this succession of publications. So the first set of publications is that it seems that Husserl has found a way through his understanding of intentionality that consciousness is always his consciousness of something, seems to move us away from the subject and helps us uncover the order that exists in the world. So he has this thing called the Wesenschau, that we intuit essences, and we can understand the structure of, um, sort of ideal objects. Um, and then, so this seems a very, this is what people latch onto very, very quickly. And it seems to be a good basis for the cosmological proof. But in 1913, he you know, himself hardly published anything for 12 years. Um, and then he publishes this book, Ideas, and he now calls him, his work a transcendental idealism. Um, and so he seems to be turning back on this. And what he basically says, he says, yes, true, we can intuit these essences. But in order to understand how we're able to do that, we need to place emphasis on uh, um, a constituting subject. Now, what precisely that means um, is enormously debated. But ultimately, it means that it is no longer possible to talk about an extra mental world. We only are able to understand um, the correlation between subject and world, um, how an object is actually given to us. And for many Catholics, this seems to undermine the, um, it means that the kind of the intuition of essences can no longer be the basis of an ontological, of a cosmological proof, because it no longer expresses an order that exists in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, as an order. Um, and so the kind of the question is, is does phenomenology um, a neutral way of discovering the order of the world, um, an order which points to the existence of God? That's a path to Catholicism. Or is it say that that order that we discover can only be understood by paying attention to the constituting subject um, and therefore kind of ultimately undermine the idea that God is the author of that order? Um, and I think, you know, uh, um, and so then it becomes a kind of you know, a question of how you read. Um, Husserl and how you understand the relationship between these two elements. Um, mm. So Edelstein is moving towards Catholicism through <laughs> him and rejects the latest transcendental idealism. Heidegger sort of moves through the transcendentalism of, of Husserl and moves away from the church. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the, what are the yeah? So what on each side? What would one side? You know, and I, I know it's a bit rough to sort of say a side there, but in what sense would should, could we say that, say, Edith Stein would say that the other side, the Heideggerians, are misconstruing uh, who sells phenomenology? Yeah. I mean, I think there's sort of the... It's clear that I think that Husserl has moved away from or either has kind of worked out things which were already in Nietzsche in uh, um, his earlier work or has moved away from his earlier work. And so the, the trick for Catholics is, is, to, is to say, well, actually, Husserl has got a little bit wrong. Husserl has been, um, and what's kind of interesting about this is previously, you know, the Catholics were going, yeah, here's somebody who <laughs> says, well, we like this. But, you know, that's like an article, maybe. And then but suddenly you have somebody who uh, um, seems to be moving away from your ideas, and then it becomes highly pro problematic. And then you have to really engage with them. Um, and you know, this is also partly because the, the strict Catholics, the strict Thomists, as I was saying earlier, who said, no, 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 let's just read Thomas as Thomas. Let's not get into all this modern stuff. You, um, they were saying, I told you so. Mm -hmm. You know, you got your hands dirty. You started to read um, modern philosophy and look where it got to you. This is an enormous embarrassment. So, so these Catholics had, and there were multiple ways they could do it. So they could say, well, okay, so we want, we like the order. Um, uh, maybe what we need to do is we need to emphasize uh, um, a kind of a concrete subject rather than a transcendental subject and think about that subject who as also a faith 
with you know um, imbued with faith and maybe that's a way of getting beyond so this is what Edith Stein does is that, that there's a form of knowing which is beyond the kind of the um apodictic knowing that Husserl's trying to get at which is the, the knowing of faith um that you know one might be um Josef Geiser, for instance, who picks as he was um, Husserl's colleague, he says, well, yes, you're right that there is in some ways this constituting subject, but um, we've misidentified who that constituting subject is. It's actually God. That's actually a theocentric uh, religion. It's just Husserl has misidentified it as the, um, as the ego. Um, one kind of, another way is to say, well, the, Part of the problem with the earlier um, uh, transcendental uh, investigations is that it, it, it just produced ideal objects. We just covered the object of ideal objects, which were the bra we bracketed whether they existed or not. And maybe that was the problem. Maybe if we actually try and do a phenomenology of the existing world, uh, an existential philosophy, then maybe it wouldn't have the problems of this um, uh, idealism. Um, and so, and then another possibility would be to say, well, yes, this is very good at describing what it, ex it is to experience the world, but it is still just experience for us. And so therefore we need to supplement it with a metaphysics. And in some ways, this is what John Paul II does. He's, he reads a phenomenological ethics and says, yes, it helps us explain a lot about what you know, the experience of ethics is, but um, it also makes us realize that this is inadequate and we need to sort of embed phenomenology within a kind of a, a Thomist metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So just out of interest, I mean, these uh, strict Thomists that you're, you're alluding yeah. to who said, look, we don't bother with that stuff. We'll just keep on, keep on this part. Are, yeah. are they, do, do we still have camps of these people around who are still, you know, as there is any new iteration in philosophy, they say, look, we, 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 we just stick to the path. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I'm sure your listeners might have a better view on that than I do. I would have thought probably, I think this is a relatively perennial problem, a relative, you know, sort of considering both uh, what it means to engage with thought that could, that has an enormous potential because it allows you to engage with non-believers and therefore to, um, you know, spread God's word um, we, against the, the other side of the coin, which is that, um, you know, if you if you do that too much, maybe you will concede too much. Maybe you will pick up too much. Maybe the one who will be converted is you. Mm. Um, right? And I I would would guess that that is still there are still those concerns um, within the church. But I, mm. I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to. Mm. Okay, I do. I sort of, uh, but I'm not sympathetic to that view. But I'm sort of. Uh, I find it quite humorous of the idea of you know this huge new thing comes around and. People just say no. We're just we're just not going to engage with it. This, yeah, just close your close your ears and just don't bother and carry on. Um, yeah. and there's almost there's almost something uh, somewhat I can almost respect that in a way. <laughs> well, I mean, in some ways, you know, the, the I I am torn about it. Is uh, you know, um, I in some ways the progressive Catholics are enormously sympathetic because they are you know engaged in a very serious project of, of taking people's ideas seriously working through them trying to engage in conversations over quite large sociological divides um but and yet at the same time you know you have an example of somebody like heidegger who seems to do this and then that seems to ease his path away from the church so you know i i think one would have to you know well I, I, I enormously respect that project, but uh, I think you know, in some ways the, the point about the dangers is also well taken. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll jump to Heidegger in a minute because he's such a key figure. But just before we do, obviously we have basically we have this philosophical divide on with with respect to Husserl's phenomenology. We have the religious divide with respect to various denominations of Christianity. Um, specifically Catholicism and then atheism, sort of as these two sides. But just on the historical and perhaps social context, is there other reasons at the time which perhaps are causing a divide which equally uh, there's a sympath sympathies with either side in some other social contexts? Yeah, I mean, I think, so I, I'm, I'm a great, sorry, I'm a great believer in the importance of understanding context, but I'm also, you know, um, I, I also don't believe that context ever determines thought. What it does is I think it adds extra stakes. It perhaps... Um, 
shifts the conversation in particular ways. I mean, the, the big things that are happening at this time, so we think in 1913, we obviously have World War I. And World War I takes many of these debates and sort of turbocharges them. Because if you believe, if you are kind of a, um, uh, somebody who believes that modernity has taken a wrong turn, then th there is, here is your evidence. Here is your evidence. Here you have uh, um, uh, a war that has killed millions, um, that has brought you know, modern liberal democracies to um, their knees. Um, and so if you want to be uh, um, <clears throat> increasingly sceptical about modern society, that might think that you are, you know, critical, it could be profoundly anti-religious in the sense that you said this as well, this is the death, this is the, this is the last um, nail in the coffin of kind of theodicy. Who can believe in theodicy after this? Mm. Um, but it could also be, you know, pr um, promote a drive to return to religious origins. You know, so maybe the Middle Ages had something going about it, maybe because of the kind of the centrality of kind of religion um, within it. And so there's this, all this return about return to the Middle Ages developing after the war. And so it takes some of these ideas about should we take Thomism and update it or should we go <laughs> return to Thomism and, and suddenly make some quite you know, world historical questions. Um, and it means also that they are no longer just the topic of conversation of a, you know, of a few doddery old academics sitting in their, you know, in their offices, it, but is, you know, we have, I talk a lot about the youth movement who embraces these ideas. We're talking about millions of people in Germany, but also in Italy and France and so on, who are trying to think through, well, you know, what they what might, might call the pathologies of modernity, um, often using, often referring to phenomenology in that way. And then of course, later on, we have, as a kind of response to that, we have a rise of fascism. And fascism also is can be pushed in lots of different directions. So some Catholics have embraced Catholicism because embraced fascism because, you know, liberal democracy it sounds seems profoundly anti-religious or um, uh, anti-Catholic. This is especially in you know um, Austria and Italy and perhaps Spain and Portugal. Here is a kind of an authoritarianism which can be used to support the church that is able to help develop all parts of kind of the human self. Um, but at the same time, you could also figure fascism, especially Nazism, as paganism. And as you know, you know precisely the problem, what, ha what happens when you raise the state to the level of a god mm -hmm. and how it should be existed. So, so again, it doesn't, you know, there are Catholics who go both ways. There are certain Catholics who I think you know, quite shamefully uh, um, collaborate, work with the Nazis, and especially with the fascists in Italy. There are also some enormously courageous Catholics who, you know, are executed because of their resistance to fascism. Um, and often they're kind of, you're in dealing with, they are engaging with some of these ideas. One of the first readers of um, Heidegger, Alfred Delp, who writes a very, very influential first article on Heidegger, which gets translated across the world. You know, he was executed as part of a um, resistance movement to Hitler. So um, you know, these ideas are also taking part in this you know, existential decision about what to do, how to respond to the kind of the great um, challenges of modernity. Mm -hmm. And what's the sort of immediate or immediate immediate reaction of the Vatican? You know, the official the official reaction of the Catholic Church to all this philosophical mm -hmm. ongoing and uproar. I mean, it's, it, it's a good question. I think often we tend to think um, that the, the Catholic Church is much more of a monolith than it actually is. Um, I want to suggest that actually, you know, I mean, the, the Church, particularly in terms of philosophical questions rather than theological questions, is quite hands off, even though it's promoting Thomism and Thomist philosophy as well as Thomist theology. Um, it's it doesn't mean that there is no space for non-Thomist forms of thinking. Um, even you know, in moments like the modernist controversy, which is a kind of a, uh, um, a resistance to modern historical methods in theology, especially around Alfred Loisy at the turn of the century. Um, this is, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't officially apply to many of the philosophical concerns um, and and even when there's, they, they introduce this anti-modernism anti oath, it's not actually you know, sort of uh, um, carried out. 
spot, it's carried out rather spotty. In Germany, you can have kind of avoid it if you want. Um, so I think you know there are actually the 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 Vatican is is relatively hands off. It's, it's only later, by 1950, in the encyclical Humanae Generis, that you have the explicit condemnation of existentialism as a kind of uh, as a kind of a child of phenomenology. Um, otherwise, it's a relatively grey space where there are concerns about moving too far, um, but um, but otherwise there are just competing factions. You know, some of these strict Thomists, especially uh, Reginald Garrigou Lagrange who's in the Vatican, who's very skeptical of all this, thinks it's a big error. Um, but also, you know, Cardinal Messi is, uh, is you know, one of the most important figures in the church, in, definitely in Belgium, but also in the French speaking world. And he is the key figure of, the, uh, of this movement that is picking up phenomenology. And in his institute, you have um, uh, enormous interest in it. So, there's a lot of space for thinking through these. There's more space for thinking through these ideas than perhaps one might at first think. Yeah, Catholics are generally more forgiving than people think. Yeah, and, and I certainly agree with the statement that it's not as much as a of a uh, you know a domineering monolith as people think that you suddenly they pick up the phone and call and get an answer <laughs> from the you know the head of the church. It's not. It's yeah. not like that at all. You know, there are still moments where um, you know. Uh, Various um, people are you know, are condemned or being close to being condemned, and that has an effect. There's you know, a chilling quality, as we say today, um, and you know where the rights to teach are taken away. Some of some uh, of the more kind of radical um, figures in uh, Milan um, uh, suffer that. But you know, but I think you're exactly right I mean, that there is there's a huge philosophical diversity within the church. Uh, and so much so that I think that you can have these arguments where some Catholics think that other Catholics are, you know, are fatally wrong in their <laughs> understanding and, and dangerously so, but are still kind of um, accepted within the church and you know, embraced by the church as a whole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I mean, one. So moving to the side of the people who, you know, who read who read this phenomenology and fall away i mean heidegger is is basically the most sort of clear example one he's he's now understood as one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century of course but equally i guess one thing that's often not always uh you know made clear about his biography is that it was it two months or two weeks he spent as a catholic as a i think it was only two weeks wasn't it as a catholic it's, it, it, training as a catholic yeah. priest um yes and some 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 historians are skeptical whether he actually had heart problems, but uh, yes. I mean, so he yeah he went to train to be a priest. Um, and uh, was it a, and was then, it a Jesuit? I think to be a Jesuit. I think yes. Okay. I mean, I just have to so not even yeah. So quite a you know severe, you know yeah, very uh, strict. Yes, I mean maybe sort of. Uh, I mean, so he is he is you know he he grows up in this small town as a Catholic. He has deeply engaged in the Catholic Church. He. Even after he stops, he, he, he withdraws from the seminary. Um, he, he's studying Catholic philosophy under the Catholic chair in Freiburg. Um, so this is somebody who, you know, biographically speaking, is, you know, uh, um, is a Catholic and has been um, deeply engaged in the institutions of uh, the church. And, and I think this is, you know, my, my argument is that he actually, he's, he's also what I would, what I, Term the a progressive neo-scholastic. He's uh, um, he he talks about the relation to Catholicism to modern philosophy in exactly the same way as all these other people, like, people like Mercier, Noel, and Agostino Gemelli in Italy. He um, he's very interested in engaging with modern thought, and he's very interested in Husserl. So he writes his thesis on Husserl, um, his first dissertation, and it's pretty. You know, I, I think it's you know, it's it's, it's, an, it's an interesting piece, but it's you know, it's a pretty standard. You know, progressive you know, classic take on Husserl, um, and and after all, his 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 goal is he wants to get this. There's this chair which has been un, not fulfilled for a very long time in Catholic philosophy because it's you know, these debates. You know, it's a bit of a fractious academic climate, and he has sets his eyes on this. He thinks he might be able to get this chair. So he's sort of you know he's. I don't think it's. I don't think it's anything more any more cynical than any other academic. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's a little bit of a cynicism there as well. Um, and, um, but then he writes this, um, his 1916 Habilitationsschrift, which is a nominally on Don Scotus, or it's based on a, on a, um, 
on a manuscript, which we now know wasn't written by Duns and Scotus. Um, but, and, and then things started to get quite complicated. Um, so first, I think he's taking lots of moves that lots of Catholics done. So we, Husserl's already but, um, 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 disappointed lots of Catholics. And so you need to sort of shift your reading of um, Husserl. And like many others, he says, well, what we need to do is we need to move beyond a description of essences to a description of existence. And so that's what lots of other Catholics are doing also in response to Husserl's sort of turn. Um, and then, but he also follows Husserl. He says, well, in order to do this, um, we take Husserl's line, we have to recognize that there is a, a constituting subject there, but that constituting subject is a concrete one, a concrete and historical one. So he's taking these two moves that could be seen as kind of being a good Catholic. Um, and I think he expects, he, he thinks this is going to get himself the chair. And so he thinks he's, he's moving in a way that fits within, um, you know, within the, 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 the broad philosophical space opened up by the church. But um, because of other responses to Husserl at the time, this, the emphasis on the concrete subject um, becomes a, a, a real problem. And um, so he gets, uh, um, he gets attacked for that. And then um, he doesn't get given the chair. The chair goes to Josef Geiser, this other guy, um, who had a different reading of Husserl, a different way to recuperate Husserl, and one which placed the kind of the turn to the egocentrism as the kind of the central problem. So if you go with Heidegger, with, with Geiser, then Heidegger has suddenly taken a, a dangerously wrong path. And so he doesn't get the chair. And I think that you know, Heidegger's really annoyed mm -hmm. by this. Um, and then he writes the final chapter of his thesis, which wasn't in the first version. And there he takes um, the, his emphasis on the concrete human subject as the means by which one has access to existence even further. Um, and in, in ways that develop kind of lines of arguments which um, are, show more explicitly why it doesn't fit with the church. And later on, he says that, you know, he comes very quickly to say, well, if one places emphasis on, you know, concrete subjectivity, it shows how the kind of the hollow nature of Thomism, which is based on you know, a dogmatic enclosure of propositions and proofs, which the living human subject is constantly constrained by and wants to break out of. And so he starts to pose his, um, his work as explicitly anti-scholastic. So I think you have multiple things going on there. You have a kind of a, a uh, an intellectual context which is, which is narrowing what's seen as acceptable for a Catholic to say. Mm -hmm. And you have Heidegger's thought reading through Husserl, which is pushing in a slightly different direction, and it leads to this moment where there's a break. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and at first it's a turn, he thinks that there's Protestant thought is more amenable to this emphasis on um, concrete subjectivity. Um, so he's reading a lot of Luther at the time. And later on, he's, he, he, he declares this a, a form of atheism. Okay, okay. Perhaps, perhaps I sort of misread what you were alluding to in your text, so correct me if I'm wrong, but one thing I, I think I sort of read in, in, in the book was that he, you, you see Heidegger's sort of the, be, the, the, the phase from Bingham time onwards where he's, you know, just this clear atheism. It's not so much an atheism which we would consider now, which inherently is almost anti-theistic, but it's like an atheism. Like he's saying, theism doesn't need to be involved in philosophy. This is just completely without yeah. it. Um, so it's not yeah. so much an attack, but from that comes almost seen as a hostile move because he's just not, in, he's not taking it seriously. He's not including it. He's beginning philosophy from a position which is atheistic. <laughs> Yes, no. So, so there's definitely a kind of you know, his atheism at that stage is um, is as you say he wants to bracket off you know theology. He said if I were to write theology, there would be I would never use the word being in it. And his whole book is about being and time. That these are very sort of distinct projects. Um, so it is it's, a, it's an atheism in that sense, and and, and quite what the atheism hides atheism is, is is a very very complicated question. But I think what is happening here is that, you know, if one thinks about it within the kind of the framework of the kind of the, um, of the thinkers he's engaging with, what he's doing is he's shutting out the theological potential of various different arguments. So, I mean, essentially what you have um, in, 
moving from the 1916 Habilitation Scriptus of the Second Dissertation, um, you say as well, he, he's describing kind of an existential ontology, an ontology of existence, um, uh, which in some ways a realist ontology. And he says in order to get there, we need to understand um, a kind of a concrete temporal human. And, um, and he thinks the first is, sort of, is has a sort of a, a complex genealogy, but coming from a form of Thomism. He later sort of says that he kind of, he's drawing from the scholastics. And this emphasis on the concrete human um, subjectivity, he thinks is um, what he comes to terms of hermeneutics and facticity, is um, pointed to this very rich material in kind of the Protestant tradition. So in some ways, he's combining these two different theological sources, but as he sort of puts it, he, he, he thinks that uh, um, they cancel each other out. So he thinks that if you, if you have an ontological reading of this uh, hermeneutic of facticity, you have to bracket out faith. Faith it becomes something which is, as you would say, is ontic rather than ontological. Mm -hmm. So it, you can't, it can't be the faithful subject. He criticizes... Um, some of the some theological readers who think that you can do a kind of an existential analysis of the faith uh, of the believing subject. Um, and then, so that, you know, so if you were trying to do an analysis of the believing subject as the kind of the foundation of a religious philosophy, then that's not possible for Heidegger. So okay, one of the kind of the, the classic Protestant roots is sort of shut off by this sort of Catholic argument that we're going to focus on ontology. And at the same point, he's, you know, he says that if it is the case that um, the uh, that we uh, have access to concrete existence through the um, this concrete human subject, then because he also places emphasis on a kind of a, a notion of um, original sin, which he thinks comes from so Luther, he, um, a, a corruption that goes right down to our very sort of core, he thinks that there's no way that through that analysis of existence, we can move along the lines of a cosmological argument to, to the existence of God. Mm -hmm. So essentially what you have there, you know, is you, he, he drew on kind of a Protestant idea about human corruption to challenge the, um, the neo-scholastic notion of philosophy as a path to God. And he drew on kind of Catholic ideas about ontology to challenge a Protestant argument that you could start from the fact of faith. And so those two theological forces leap together to an atheism, a, 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 a non-theistic um, philosophy, which, which could potentially have atheistic or anti-theistic consequences. Mm -hmm. I, feel like, I feel like that would have annoyed the Catholics more than anyone in, in those three, three camps there. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I mean, and, and, and partly because, I mean, one of the reasons why I think there was such, um, you know, that this was possible and why it was seemed so dangerous is because, you know, we're talking about a time where Protestants and Catholics are, this is not the kind of the ecumenical moment that appears in the 60s and 70s. After all. This is a time when, um, I, I, I love this moment that, that one of the key Catholics, I like, Pay a lot of attention to is Eric Tchivara, who is this German Polish Jesuit um, and a very prolific writer um, and uh, interesting thinker. And he has these debates with the Protestant thinker Karl Barth in the late 1920s. Um, and they're, they're kind of good friends, but um, uh, Karl Barth says to uh, Fritz Tchivara uh, that, you know, your, he, he builds up his thought around the analogy of entis, the analogy of being. And, um, Bart says the analogy of Entis is the invention of the Antichrist. So this is a, kind of a moment where um, Catholics and Protestants of, are, see each other as, as perhaps greater spiritual dangers than secularism. Um, mm. It's a, a profoundly divided, a profoundly divert, divert, divided Christianity. Okay. And yet from this sort of Heideggerian drawing from Catholicism, from Protestantism into this atheism, there is then a reaffirmation of Heideggerian philosophy in a Catholic, from a Catholic perspective, somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so 
So if the idea is, and this is that which is pretty standard in the Catholic world, that you know, sort of Heidegger is great because he focuses on existence, because he focuses on being. He opens up the question of being for the first time since, you know, obviously Heidegger is very critical of the scholastic understanding of being, but you know, it's um, the scholastic say, you know, what that there's something sanitary about his work in that. But if the problem is that he has been, he has sort of anchored that to a kind of a Protestant idea of subjectivity, then that also tells you how you might be able to release him from it. Um, so, um, firstly, they kind of you would read into Heidegger's work, kind of you know, some perhaps hints of a certain uh, theism. So, you know, I mean, some of these are a little bits of um, it's a slightly facetious arguments, but you know, one they think about you know, sort of Gavorf and sign thrownness, which is a central Heideggerian concept that we are thrown into a world, but you know, that pre-exists us and. Uh, um, and, you know, many have to say, well, if, if you're thrown, there must be a thrower. Um, mm -hmm. The thrower is of God. Um, or, I mean, more seriously, I think there's a kind of sense in which, you know, the kind of feeling of angst or, as for others, absurdity of existence is um, both a sign of our finitude and a of this drive for us to, to overcome it. Um, and so a kind of a sense in which, you know, that angst is in many ways like Augustine's restless heart, that it's, it's restless until it you know, rests in God. Um, and so that there are theological ways of reading um, how, as, 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 a, as a need for theological um, um, ideas. And part of the kind of the problem was is that they had been unable to do this because of his investment in a certain form of Protestant theology. So you know, one of the major arguments at the time is, well, there, maybe there's a similarity between Karl Barth, who, who describes the absolute otherness of God, um, and Heidegger, because if you, if you describe God as absolutely other, then you render the imminent um, secular world utterly devoid of the divine. And Heidegger's world is utterly devoid of the divine. So maybe there's something Protestant about that atheism there, that kind of the lack of God. And maybe a, um, a Catholic theology which recognizes the, kind of the way in which God's signs are constantly um, uh, visible within the created world. There would be ways of reading existence that would uh, um, uh, open it up to a theological reading. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. I like the idea of a, them sort of conflating Protestantism with uh, atheism, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, the idea is good. The classic idea is that Protestantism, you know, Luther focusing on the kind of the faith of the individual, sidelining the church and tradition um, uh, is the beginning of modernity and you know, atheism is, is its result. So, you know, it not, it's not that they are conflated. It's that, you know, sort of once you take that step, that you are on the slippery slope that's going to lead you to. Of course, the, the, the Protestants say, well, um, it, I mean, as people like Karl Barth say, well, the trouble about scholasticism is that by mistaking, um, the, you know, the thinking that one can see the signs of God in the world is to profane the divine. Um, thinking that one could speak for God is also to profane the divine. And so that's why you need to have this um, uh, induction of absolute otherness. So it's a... Uh, um, both of them have argument that the other one is one step away from atheism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Either by getting God too far apart or kind of integrating him too much into the natural world. Okay. And as this atheism, this sort of Heideggerian strain of atheism enters the culture in you know, 1927, and I believe being in time is immediately, is it immediately quite, people take it, it's quite big it's immediately. Yeah. 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 Is, there a re is there a reason... Do you think that you know this massive Catholic undercurrent was pushed aside in in favour of this, or was is there some historical reasons as to why you know it's one of those moments of right place, right time, sort of right yeah. context in a way? I mean, I guess after the war, this sort of thing is going to take root a bit easier. Yeah, I mean, so I think the I mean. I think there is something to be said that, you know, there are lots of problems with Heidegger, there are lots of, you know, sort of things that one has to grapple with his work. And obviously his relationship to Nazism is a very important part of that. But, you know, being in time is 
an, an amazing book, a, a, a profoundly important one. And so I think it, you know, it does um, land um, and, and, and in some ways cast aside many of these, you know, um, these other texts, but I think it's really in some ways are, are perhaps less interesting, less, um, uh, less good than he is. Um, but at the same time, I think that there is this, a lot of Catholic readings of Heidegger. There's a lot of attempts to recuperate Heidegger. There's, um, there's oh, in various sorts. Um, and so um, I, I think we, we should recognize the, you know, the enormous importance of, of a form of kind of Christian Heideggerianism and a Christian existentialism, which t- takes a different route um, to Heidegger, but is sort of parallel. And it's probably, I think, only in, you know, um, post-war where the, you know, the um, the real dominance of these ideas starts to, or, or, you know, of the kind of the secular version starts to really take um, hold. You know, I think Sartre is an enormously important version. You know, Sartre, um, when he, so he published the, the very famous lecture he gave in 1945, Extension as a Humanism, is in some ways he, he recognizes the existence of all these Christian existentialists. Christian, also kind of Christian Heideggerians, and he wants to sort of both he recognize that they exist and wants to sort of say that they are illegitimate at the same time. So he is um, both a marker of, of how significant they were at the time and also one of the people who are trying to sort of sideline them. And then I you know, but I still, even then in the 1950s and 60s, you have considerable influential strands of Christian Heideggerians, even actually up until the into the present day, um, but then, but I think things really start to change in the fifties and sixties, where um, the, the 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 place of um, organized religion in Europe that there is a kind of um, a, a significant change in um, uh, church going and the importance of um, religiously oriented philosophy. So there's a um, I. I, I would I would suggest that, that actually there is uh, a very very important and influential Christian strands of philosophy which are carrying past 1927 into the 30s 40s and 50s and um, it's afterwards that we really get the kind of uh, um, um, the real sidelining and even then there are still still very important you know, very important Catholic philosophers like John Marion for instance. Or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Philosophically, however, do they do they begin to not so much struggle, but the the ability to work with something such as the the work of Sartre, which you know, just as an anecdote, Dreyfus said was the biggest misreading of being in time. Yeah, uh, put the paper, which yeah. I always quite liked. But this entry into uh, more of a, a pure meaninglessness, you know, um, yeah. it existence precedes essence, etc. Do Catholic philosophers begin to sort of struggle to have any sort of theological anchor there, and any way to really deal with this text in a in a constructive manner? Well, I mean, I, I would say that even then, even then with Sartre, there's a lot of emphasis on attempting to recuperate. You know, there's um, there is a sense in which existential is actually this Christian thing, and then Sartre has sort of stolen it, and so that that in some ways he's gone wrong. Um, so. I mean, one of the criticisms of um, uh, Gabriel Marcel, who is one of the, kind of the key figures in the book, who organised this, um, uh, you know, this evening discussion group, which was enormously influential, which Sartre went to as well, along with people like Levinas and um, others, uh, Melo Ponti and Simon de Beauvoir and others. Um, but he says, he says, you know, um, he has this review of a week long, sort of. Um, and he says, well, of course, hell is other people. If the three people you've chosen, you know, one's killed their child, one's an adulterer, um, one's a murderer. <laughs> of course, those are hellish people. But you know, if you've chosen a loving mother, a kind of a, um, a noble general and a Carmelite nun, then, then you know, you'd have a different view. Um, and at this, the same time, one, you know, uh, another critic of Sartre said, well, you know, if you, you focus on all these terrible parts of human existence, um, but you know there are you know there's there's love and there's fidelity and there are these all these other aspects of human existence which would give a very very different understanding of of um, 
uh, of the world. And, um, you know, he, she famously said, you know, he's forgotten smiles of babies. <laughs> and, <laughs> of course, became, you know, was, was then picked up and mocked. But the point is still there, that, you know, that maybe a, a, a deep existential analysis of different aspects of life will get, bring you to different conclusions. And, uh, um, and that what the problem with thought is that is what he chose to describe and how he chose to understand it. Um, Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so I guess the 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 big question, which I mean, is in in terms of these podcasts, I do in terms of these often neglected thinkers. There is often a strand which runs through the majority of them, which is a sincere belief in you know some religion, and often it is a sincere belief in Christianity. And there's many many thinkers who are neglected. I'm not going to say ignored because I genuinely don't think there is an agenda there. It's just how these things happen. Do you think, you know, there there are these historical reasons or maybe even philosophical reasons why there is currently, definitely currently, I don't think that's yeah. even a question, a primacy of secular philosophy over Catholic philosophy, or could even say philosophy which is accepting of, you know, a sincere religious, uh, you know, acceptance? I mean, I think, I, I suppose the historian in me would say kind of institutions matter. Mm. And you know, that there have been times in the past where um, Catholic, c- Catholics have um, been the, the dominant voices mm-hmm. within you know, academic institutions um, and that at different times, the, uh, um, because of the development of different fields, um, uh, institutions where, um, which don't have, have the same um, emphasis on religious faith have um, <clears throat> have tended to be more marginal. So you still have kind of you know, Catholic institutions and seminaries, um, but they're often outside of, um, uh, located outside of many of the kind of the main academic institutions of the modern age. Um, but I suppose, that, so in that way, I think, you know, it's true that there is, uh, um, I think, you know, sort of, an ignorance of, of many of these ideas, um, the and uh, you're looking elsewhere for um, inspiration. But I suppose one of my points about the book is that even if you know uh, individuals or philosophers motivated by a sincere religious faith are perhaps less represented in modern institutions, ideas that were cultivated in that environment still are. So, you know, what I wanted to show in the book was that the enormous importance of these Catholic intellectuals for filtering, shaping, opening up particular arguments about phenomenology, um, about our understanding of the world, universe, ethics, and so on, that have counterintuitively come to inform um, uh, explicitly atheistic thought. So that's why so I end on so, you know, Maurice Meloponti, who has this sort of Catholic background, but um, later disavows it. Um, but you know, I want to suggest that nonetheless, his ideas are still profoundly influenced by, not that they are in some way secretly Catholic or secretly hmm. uh, um, Christian, but that that history mattered and that history shaped, that he would have thought differently without that history. And in that way, you know, I think you can say that um, many of the ideas that we engage with in the secular academy um, have this genealogy which moves through Christianity. Um, that me- that means, I think, that we should pay attention to read that, understand that genealogy, to read the text that informed it, to learn more about it. Um, I think it means that um, there are, it can tell us, I think, some things about modern secular thought that we would, might be uncomfortable to think about otherwise. Maybe um, perhaps when, you know, modern secular thought perhaps resembles too much certain forms of uh, um, religious thinking. But also at the same time, I think that there are many sources within religious thought that can continue to inspire um, and help us think better about um, a range of different problems. And in some ways, what I want to sort of, you know, 
what I'd hope that readers will take away from the books is that um, labels like Catholic and atheist, and Protestant, they matter, but they don't, they, are, they don't draw sharp lines between thinking. And thinking very rarely um, remains within the lines that one draws around it anyway. And mm. if that's the case, then um, we should look to be nourished from, we, we shouldn't restrict ourselves from where we um, seek intellectual nourishment. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, is there anything you'd like to add about the book uh, which, which you feel we sort of critically left out? I, nothing, nothing that comes to mind. Okay, but, okay. Obviously, there, obviously, there is a lot more in the book than. But there are other we... things. That, um, um, where about? I, I, oh, sorry. I think yeah, I think we covered this, the main points. So. Mm -hmm. uh, whereabouts can we we find the book? So you can find the book. Um, I guess at some good bookstores. Not, not all, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can say every good bookstore. I'm afraid this is academic publishing, um, but on online the sellers and um, directly from Harvard University Press. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, are you working on any new books now or is it just papers and pieces? So, I mean, I'm uh, my first two books were um, had a heavy dose of Catholicism. I, I'm now moving to a, 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 um, a slightly different, you know, if, if in many ways, uh, with different movement with, with perhaps some surprising similarities. And I'm, I'm interested in, um, I'm, I'm working on a current project on Marxism. Um, essentially, as, a, as an intellectual historian, I'm very interested in the types of institutions that take ideas and um, make them meaningful forces in the world. And one thing that I think, you know, Marxists and Catholics have done is they're able to take quite, take ideas really seriously, um, think about them um, and uh, integrate them into broad social projects, you know, for good and for ill, but, uh, but certainly, uh, what you, I don't think what you can say, you can't say that um, either doesn't take ideas seriously. And, uh, um, and that's what I like about both. Okay. How, is that, is that, and that's going to be a full length, full length book? We'll see, but we're getting there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Edward Baring, thanks very much. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure.